Hi, everyone. Welcome to Breast Cancer Related Lymphedema with Dr. Ting Ting Kuo. My name is Christine Benjamin, and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Ting Ting Kuo. Ting Ting Kuo has been practicing physical, is a practicing physical therapist for over 17 years. She is currently the outpatient therapy manager at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and prior to that was the NYU Langone Medical Center Rusk Institute for over 14 years, where she managed the women, women's and men's health physical therapy program. Ting Ting has a doctor of physical therapy degree and is also board certified in women's health physical therapy. She has been active in the field of lymphedema for 15 years and is dedicated to providing awareness and education to both the clinical and cancer survivorship communities. Ting Ting, we're so happy to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Well, it is such a pleasure to be here and be able to share uh, some information with you. Um, what I'd like to do is provide an overview first of the presentation uh, to give you an understanding of what we might be touching upon. Please definitely send in any questions. Happy to answer as much as I can uh, of what I know. Um, and if I do not know, we would find you a way to get you that information as best we can. So regarding the presentation, the overview is going to be first, I think, on the background of the various systems of the body. Uh, and then we move on to the discussion of why lymphedema may occur, and also then into the treatment options. We're going to then share some information on minimizing the associated risk factors, a bit of additional information at the end, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. OK, so hopefully everyone can see the screen. So we're going to move on to first uh, the circulatory system. So what's really important to understand is that the body is a closed system. So we have arteries which bring the blood, the oxygen, the nutrients, and proteins all circulating through the system, giving us what we need to go ahead and, and make sure that we can function throughout the day. We also have two other systems that are associated to the circulatory system. One is the venous system, and that absorbs the fluid and the protein, transports proteins, and removes waste products and brings it back into the central system so that it can be removed. In addition, there's the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system also transports protein molecules. We'll get into each one. Uh, we'll get into uh, the lymphatics in a little bit of time. But it also, like the venous system, removes waste products. So when we look at the photo, the picture, the illustration, this is a beautiful illustration because what we see is the red is actually the arterial system. The blue is the venous system, so it takes all the deoxygenated blood back and brings it back into the central system and also removes the waste products. And then we have the green, which is the lymphatic vessels that work alongside the venous system in order to remove the waste products as well. So in the lymphatic system, it is an amazing, amazing system in the human body. It defends against the pathogens, it defends and removes bacteria and waste products, it provides us immunity, nutrition, and maintains our fluid balance. So we know that when we're not feeling well, a lot of times our internists will go ahead and, and feel around our neck to see if the lymph nodes are swollen. If the lymph nodes, which we have in the insert, the picture of the green, it looks like a little kidney bean. When we feel that and that's a little bit swollen, what that means is that it's just working. The lymphatic system can really work harder than it normally does, up to 10 times the amount um, that it normally, when you're feeling well and the body's doing well, uh, the lymphatic system's working okay, um, but it can kick up to 10 times the level to remove waste products, fight your infections, fight that cold, that flu. Um, and so all this, a lot of the fluid gets filtered through the lymph nodes. Um, and lymph nodes are at very specific locations throughout the body. The main areas is at the neck, in the underarm area, in the abdomen, your belly area, along the back of the spine. Um, and also the pelvic area. We do have lymph nodes at the elbow, the behind the knee, and in other locations. So it's not just in definitely one location, but there are definitely central areas that lymph nodes collect, and that's really where it filters through. Now, when we look at the lymphatic system drainage, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but I love the pictures because what we see, and hopefully you can see my arrow here, but three quarters of the body drains through the thoracic duct. So what's really fascinating is that we have our entire, we have our head, arms, legs, but three quarters, the yellow, only drains through the, lymphat the thoracic duct, which then drains into the, 
subclavian vein. So we can see here thoracic duct drains into subclavian vein. One quarter of the body, which is the upper right side of the body, drains through the right lymphatic duct. So when we think about, okay, we have a lot of, um, you know, you have abdominal, you have uh, the upper left extremity, the left arm, all that really has to push through the, lymph the thoracic duct. Um, and again, the right side only then goes through the right lymphatic duct, which is all near the heart. Everything then gets dumped in and gets processed out and filtered all over again. What we have here in this picture is not necessarily what we can do is extrapolate it to understand that when we move, we have what's called anchoring filaments, these little microfilaments. And I like to think of it as, um, you know, little, like little pieces of string. They're attached to right underneath your skin. So when we move, we actually don't swell because a lot of times our skin stretches. Then what happens is it pulls on these anchoring filaments and fluid and protein gets pulled into this one-way system and gets sucked in, basically. And all that, then it doesn't come out. So when the skin moves, the anchoring filaments pull, fluid and protein come in, and then it goes deeper and deeper into our lymphatic system and our collective system. And then again, it filters through, just like we talked about here, the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct. So one thing that's very important to understand is that the fluid balance, the homeostasis. So we have what's called Starling's Law, and fluid and protein in must equal fluid and protein out. So what does that mean? That means that going back to um, what we talked about right here is that in the circulatory system, anything coming in through the arterial system, our arteries, must come out, and what's picked up then is through the venous system and the lymphatic system. So in Starling's Law, what we discussed then is that anything that's coming in through the arterial system must also be flushed out in order to maintain balance. The venous system takes up the small protein molecules, the majority of the small protein molecules, which, you know, on average ranges anywhere from 85 to 90 percent. You can hear different statistics, whether it's 80 percent or, um, you know, around that range. But generally, what's key to know is that our venous system takes the small protein molecules back into the central system to get rid of it. The lymphatic system, which is its counterpart, right, takes then the remaining 10 to 15 percent of protein. And these are the large protein molecules. So the lymphatic system is very specific in that its valves, its ability to take in larger proteins is what makes it different than the venous system, which has smaller valves, smaller areas and, and, and regions where it can pull in the protein molecules. I found this picture online. This is a from a gentleman that indicated that this was actually, this is actually lymph fluid. Now, lymph fluid can come in different colors somewhat, but my understanding is that it does come in this milky white color. And this was actually from a thoracic abdominal injury, and this is what occurred. Um, I, I don't know how he had a, I don't know how he had a, like a test tube and then put in that from the lymphatics, but um, this is supposedly lymph fluid right here. So when we look at the breast drainage, right, so what we want to take a look at is to see we have a lot of axillary nodes. Um, we have nodes that are internal mammary that are here that are not pictured. We have supraclavicular nodes, which are right above your clavicle bone, and that lead to your neck. The head and neck drains through those nodes. But we have nodes that are related to the breast, and not all the nodes are shown, but clearly we have an axillary chain. And so what I wanted to point out in this case was that there is a very specific breast drainage in which about 80% of the breast drains through the underarm. So this chain right here. 20% then drains through the neck and the liver, which is obviously down here. So what's really interesting to know is that the breast itself mainly drains through the axillary chain. Now, Lymphedema from breast cancer is considered a secondary lymphedema, in meaning that a true lymphedema or primary lymphedema that you might have heard of is actually when someone is born with a, uh, you know, a, a, a changed, altered mechanical lymphatic system from birth. So in this case, when it's from breast cancer, this is not, this is considered a secondary lymphedema, and that's what it's usually termed as. Now, what it is, is it's accumulation of protein-rich fluid. Um, okay, hopefully everyone can 
hear me. The phone went out for a little bit. So um, what we see then is that again, we have the lymph drainage and we have this protein rich fluid, which we know is the uh, from the lymphatic system, which takes the large protein molecule. lymph nodes um, with their sentinel lymph node or an axillary lymph node, radiation, and you don't necessarily have to have surgery. Uh, you can just have radiation and that can also affect the lymphatic system. And that's mainly not necessarily the lymph nodes like the surgery was removed, but actually the radiation affects the surrounding tissue in which the, the problem ends up that there's a strangulation of the lymphatic vessel. Um, when there is really tightness, fibrosis, you know from radiation potentially, uh, if you've experienced it, that the skin gets tighter, it does change, the pliability and the elasticity has also changed. Um, and so what we're looking for in that the lymphatic vessels, if let's say when the surgery it was cut through because you have to cut through tissue, when you cut through tissue you do cut through usually lymphatic system, but the lymphatic vessels actually have the opportunity to regenerate. The lymph nodes, again, do not have the ability to regenerate. So when we're looking at surgery and we're looking at the incision, a lot of times the body will find ways to reroute. And that's why a lot of individuals will never develop lymphedema. And there's actually a low risk relatively of developing lymphedema. We do not know at this point why individuals with the same body type, with the same lifestyle, why one person develops lymphedema and why another person does not. Um, there is research being done in terms of the genetic makeup of an individual. Uh, it could be the history, but at this point, we're still in the early stages, but we're very hopeful that we'll have more and more information in the research realm. In terms of the radiation, again, it is the literal strangulation. It's the changing of the tissue that surrounds the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system actually does need to uh, move. It has to be able to contract because there is a natural contractility of the lymphatics in order to move that fluid through the system. So when that, when the lymphatic system is not able to contract and when it can't move, you know, it's like wearing very tight clothes. You, you just feel a little bit more restricted. It's the same thing with our lymphatic system. Now I put the chemo-induced edema not necessarily because you develop lymphedema from chemotherapy, but actually what ends up, what is somewhat common is individuals indicate that they feel swollen, that they see swelling in their hands. Um, you know, generally speaking, a great way to determine is obviously speaking to your physician and the medical team. They will be able to diagnose. But if you notice that both hands, like both feet, you know, both sides of the body have equal amounts of swelling, that's generally a chemo-induced edema. And so when the chemotherapy cycles end, you'll probably most likely, the body will be able to then remove all the, all, all the um, toxins and lymphatics that are going through and you'll see a decrease in the swelling. When it becomes where you really notice a, a asymmetrical difference, so one arm or one hand or one upper arm or forearm looks different much more than the other opposite side, it's usually the side that's not affected in terms of having any surgery or anything like that, then that's when you really need to go and follow up with your medical team. So the sentinel lymph node biopsy has, is 
is actually been around for quite a while, but it's still they still say that it's relatively new, but it has been around for quite a bit of time. And this was a wonderful development because this removes actually less lymph nodes than the traditional axillary lymph node dissection. And many surgeons, um, this is what they try to focus on is my understanding because obviously they don't want to create more injury or more any changes that they don't have to. So they're very careful um, about finding out, determining what they can do at the beginning. And if things change in the surgery, obviously that's something they discuss with you before you even go into surgery generally. Um, so any questions, you definitely should uh, round back with your medical team. So with the sentinel lymph node biopsy, it's often called SLMB, it's through a lymphocentigraphy. So this radioactive dye, this blue protein, blue dye protein, is injected near the tumor site, the tumor bed in a sense. And what they do is they wait for a little bit of time and they might massage that area and then they go ahead and see where the actual drainage from that tumor site is going to go through the lymphatic chain. So you see the blue here and it sees, oh, so this area really drains to here because certain areas might drain to the internal mammary. It might, it might be in different areas that it goes to. So what we then see is a very clear distinction through the skin of where it is, right? And you see these two little nodes right here. Um, and then you use the Geiger counter, this probe, to find the hottest, what we call the hottest node in which the radioactive substance then is detected. And that is the area and that is the lymph node, that section where the surgeon will go in to remove the sentinel lymph node. Um, sometimes it's one. They always try to shoot for the least amount to take out, is what I understand. Um, but sometimes when it comes out, they're so tiny, you know, that it comes out in little, um, might be more than one sentinel lymph node. So then they go ahead and, and just list how many nodes were taken out. At that point, that's what they're going to then remove, right? Because there are times where you can still be there and they'll send it off to pathology, uh, these lymph nodes to be tried to be examined right away um, to see if there is any metastasis. Uh, and then if not, you, they might go ahead and do the surgical procedure, um, lumpectomy, whatever it is, and then they go ahead and send it off to pathology with the tissue. Now when the tissue comes back, Obviously, we need to have clean margins. We need to see if other things, so whether or not an, a secondary procedure needs to occur, um, that is then determined once the pathology reports come in. So what's the benefit? The benefit is that there's decreased pain, there's decreased numbness, and there's decreased risk of lymphedema. I mean, I, I do definitely feel this picture is so beautiful in the illustration because it's, it does share with you exactly what happens at each stage. And again, the benefit is that there is less uh, invasiveness as associated then with an axillary lymph node dissection, which we'll go over next, that we see. So there's a lot less of the side effects potentially experienced. So in the axillary lymph node dissection, this has been around for a very long time. So again, we see the axillary chain. This is just a different uh, illustration. And what we look at is in each underarm, there's about 20 or 30 lymph nodes. It varies. Um, you know, I might have 20 and Someone else might have 35. But what we want to take a look at is there's three levels when we do an axillary lymph node dissection. Level one is generally right on the side of the breast. Level two is underneath some of our pectoralis uh, muscles. And level three is right above that area. So when we say we had a level two dissection, what happens is you don't just jump to the level two. You, you actually go through level one and level two, um, removing those lymph nodes. But level three is intact. If level three dissection is done, and they say all the lymph nodes are removed, um, generally they, it's just a general consensus that as many as the lymph nodes in this axillary chain have then been removed and sent to pathology. So what are our goals for lymphedema therapy? In general, our goals have been consistently the same. We want to make sure that the texture and the softness of whatever area is affected. And for um, breast cancer-related lymphedema, it could be in the, you know, in the, the shoulder area, the arm area, the breast, the trunk, the chest, the back area, the sides where, you know, the side of the chest, any area like that can be affected. So what we're really looking is to assess the pliability and the mobility of soft tissue in any of these areas. And a good thorough assessment 
will indicate whether or not we we feel like there might be some some residual swelling. Um, and again, you know, right after surgery, what's really challenging is to know what's post-surgical edema and what's really lymphedema. And so there has to be that balance of understanding. So as a physical therapist, I cannot diagnose, right? So that's out of my scope of practice. But what we do look at is we collect all the information in our objective measures and we put together a picture. Obviously, we communicate with the physician and then we go about um, including and working with you and collaborating with the, the individual coming in for care to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of our goals for the therapy. Um, so again, treatment, texture, we minimize the risk of infections, which we also call cellulitis. So cellulitis is not just the fatty deposits that is commonly that we understand, but cellulitis is a medical term also for um, infection. Infection. So we want to minimize the risk of that. And how do we do that? We minimize, we improve the te tissue texture. We make sure that there's fluid is moving through the system, uh, and we really, in, you know, set you up with a home uh, a self management program in which to achieve these goals and continue it even after you've been even after you graduate from limb therapy. We want to minimize the symptoms of the pain, fullness, and pressure, heaviness, and tightness that are often uh, felt. Um, in terms of the pain, pain generally has not been, you know, automatically associated with lymphedema therapy. But we definitely recognize that there are individuals that experience pain due to lymphedema. So we, it's not... socially, in our society, in going out, in the summer, how not wearing, you know, short sleeve shirts or when you do wear and being self-conscious, we definitely recognize that cosmetically um, that's something that we really want to make sure that we address and work with the person on um, as a goal as well. And lastly, we want to make sure that we educate and we empower. So even my role now is to, I absolutely enjoy sharing as much information that I have. When people come and I'm seeing someone, I make sure that they understand that I'm here for them and that I make sure that they understand that, you know, my role is to share all the information that I have, as much as I have, that relates to them so that they can almost be the therapist. So they can know because the person that comes in, they're the ones that know their body the best. I'm just there to assist and make sure that I can answer any questions and provide my guidance and my services um, to achieve the goals that we set together. So overall, there are generally six components of lymphedema treatment, which is the manual lymphatic drainage. Often you might hear it called MLD. Um, we, we, we generally don't call it massage, which I know some people do. Um, Self-drainage is what I call it for teaching someone to do it because it's really not a massage. Like It's not like I would go to a corner store and all of a sudden be able to ask for a massage because there really definitely does take training in order to be effective um, in learning how to do the manual lymph drainage and knowing where to move the fluid, um, so that's important to know. The multi-layer bandaging, exercise, the vasopneumatic compression devices, the compression garments, and also education, again, on self-management uh, and empowerment. So for manual lymph drainage, it's basically a highly skilled and sequenced hands-on technique that guides fluid and protein back into the central, body central system by utilizing uncompromised areas of the lymphatic system. So there are times where one person, their body routes the fluid differently than another person. So there definitely has to have an understanding of where the body is taking the fluid, and if it's not working out, where else can we move the body, move the, the the lymph fluid that might be stagnating um, and helping the lymphatics 
uh, redirect to an area that can be taking that fluid and removing it, as we said, back into the central system. The multi-layer bandaging overall, they're low stretch bandings, right? So they're absolutely different than ACE wraps. They actually have the exact opposite working properties of ACE wraps. Um, so ACE wraps actually really stretch out 200, 300 percent of itself. Um, and when you actually are at rest, it actually constricts. So that's actually the opposite of these low stretch bandages. These low stretch bandages are made in Europe um, and they look exactly like ACE wraps. However, they only stretch to about 60, 70, 80 percent. Um, so it does create a semi-rigid compression so that when it's applied and then you move, which is very important, movement with the banding is very important, then what happens is that the muscles pump against the semi-rigid compression, which are these, these bandages, that allows the valves to open, the skin to stretch, the valves to open, and again, the lymph fluid, the, the larger protein molecules associated to then get pulled into the system and get rerouted through the central system and removed. Now, the banding also, there's different materials, right? So this picture is a very simple brown bandaging. There is a stocking net under that. You could have finger wraps. Um, you could have foam, and there's various uh, various foam options, um, and it is really a, a, a craft and a skill. So when you come in for, when someone comes in for treatment, uh, and at the beginning we're determining what materials to best use, it could be a trial and error. Uh, it could be where it's working out well for a week or two, and then we have to change it because the body seems like it's acclimating or it's adapting. So we always have to be very vigilant, and that's where we depend on the person coming in that we're working with to tell us, hey, listen, you know, listen, I've been banding 23 hours a day except for when I'm bathing, um, 24 hours a day except for when I'm bathing, and I'm really, you know, noticing that as soon as I take it off, it, the fluid comes back, and then we have, uh, you know, so, but then when I bandage, it comes back down again. So that information is really important to share with anyone going through currently lymphedema therapy with the therapist at this point. The bandaging, again, does reduce the arm. It is so powerful. So I know it's not necessarily the most comfortable um, when we teach people, like therapists are educating the person coming in to perform the bandaging. It is labor intensive. We do understand that. And I think what's really key is to determine what can you really do, what can you really commit to? Because if you wear the bandages for six hours and you don't wear it for 18 hours, you know, that 18 hours, everything that you did that six hours, which was great, doesn't necessarily get carried through. So what I really, it's like you're almost fighting yourself. And so what I really say is that it's important to understand that there is a beginning and there is an end. So if you can commit to it at the beginning, your results are going to be much, much higher, much better than if you don't do the banding. Now, there are alternatives, so that's something that we also are going to discuss a little bit later on. So in terms of the softening the tissue, it breaks up the fibrosis and the firmness, and it really shapes and supports the arm tissue and the skin for the bandaging. Once you plateau to measurements, we go on to compression garments. Now, compression garments, so therapists obviously also have different training and different backgrounds, and they will work with you to determine whether or not compression garments are absolutely needed, when are they needed, when should you use them. There are individuals that definitely need compression 24 hours a day, even at the end. Most individuals are able to do a, you know, a balance between compression garments when needed or bandaging and the treatment still con continues. So it's highly individualized and again, it's the individual goal of what they want to do, their lifestyle, how active they are, and what they can commit to again. And that's absolutely respected and should be understood. And all the options are provided to the individual for them to make then an informed decision along with your therapist. So once, they, once the arm and the hand stabilizes, we fit you with these compression garments in terms of we either send you to a vendor and that vendor is a certified fitter and they'll go ahead and measure you. Um, some therapists do, uh, do measurements in their clinic. It just depends on that uh, therapist operational, you know, environment that they're working in. So the compression garments, what I really want to note is that it's not a treatment, right? So compression garments are mainly a maintenance tool and it supports the soft tissue and the skin. There's different fabric, there's different material, there's different pressures, there's um, off-the-shelf 
ready-made versus compression garments. If you have a, a slightly, you know, your arm doesn't necessarily fit into an off-the-shelf, you might need to have compress, uh, custom garments um, created that are measured and specific to your, your arm. So what I say is, like, if you're a size six pair of pants, you know, that's pretty much, you know, you put it on the next day, it might stretch out a little bit, but pretty much that's a size six pair of pants. And it's the same thing with compression garments. What you're fitted for is essentially what is it's going to stay. So when if you are thinking about it using it as a treatment now for stage one, it can be used as a treatment where potentially there has been a study by the NIH that was done that indicated if you were stage one lymphedema, which is early um, lymphedema, that there is a chance that when you put this um, garment on, it could potentially bring the swelling down. Um, again, it's the same concept potentially as compression bandaging, uh, so that's something to discuss also with your medical team. The pressure can differ between a 20 to 30 versus a 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury. So generally, the minimum you should go into is a 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. So two others, the vasomatic compression device, um, you know, there is some thought about whether or not that's beneficial or not, I think it's important to understand what the use is for. So if you were doing the, in your self-management plan, compression bandaging, you were doing your self-manual lymph drainage, um, this could easily be an adjunct. But this is really indicated as an adjunct to a comprehensive lymphedema program. If you were just doing this on its own without any compression, without any compression garments, bandaging, or self-drainage, you know, it could still be okay, but it's really not necessarily um, potentially going to give you what you're you're looking for in terms of reduction. Um, it might maintain, and it definitely feels good. Um, and there are different levels and devices of compression, um, the vasomatic compression devices. So you definitely want to have a conversation with your lymphedema therapist and the medical team to see which one is the most appropriate one, because they definitely do vary. Um, you have to understand also that insurance only covers a limited amount, so it might cover one device in five years. So if you're not going to be able to commit to using the device, which is generally the program can change, but it's usually about an hour, um, and you're not really thinking about using it more than you know one or two times a week, it's probably not the best option for your self-management plan. If you're going to be using it a little bit more, that's something that you can really have a conversation about. Now, if there are people that are unable to bandage for different reasons. Um, physically, they're unable to bandage, or potentially they just don't feel like that they're going to be able to commit to it. And that is okay, again. That is something that is for the individual to determine and then have a conversation with the treating lymphedema therapist. So there are alternatives, too, in which they're a little bit easier. Um, they're Velcro ready-made devices. There's custom devices. Velcro, but they do come with a cost associated. Uh, insurance doesn't always necessarily cover everything and depends on your insurance and the individual insurance and how the coverage is. So I think that what's important is to understand that just because you don't bandage doesn't mean that there's nothing that we can do. We can still do education. We can still teach you self-manual lymph drainage. We can look into alternatives. But what's really important is have that set before you start your treatment. Because you also want to go through your insurance process and have these visits and treatments when you don't even know how we're going to look at the, the end goal, achieve your goal, um, achieve to make sure that you have minimized your decreased risk of lymphedema, and also at the end you go through the whole process, and if, if nothing's set up, then you're back to where you started, which would be an unfortunate situation. So we look at exercise, which is also one of the six components. And exercise, I'm not going to read this to you. This is here for you in terms of discussing really what exercise can do. There are so many studies that have demonstrated that pretty much throughout all the population, the cancer survivorship and all aspects of cancer treatment and cancer care, exercise is so integral and important to incorporate. And what I want to say is that exercise doesn't mean 30 minutes a day or running or jogging, because I think that that's something that's a misunderstanding. Exercise for someone going through chemotherapy could be just walking, um, you know, walking to the car or not walking around the lobby for 10 minutes. It could be something where, you know, it's not like 
all or none. So I think that's really important to understand what can you commit to again? What can you kind of push yourself to do a little bit extra? Can you get off the subway, stop one extra, and walk that extra five blocks to get to wherever you're going? Or the bus, stop one bus stop away. Um, it doesn't have to be a continuous, although that is usually the best, but it could be intermittent, in which you walk for five minutes, you rest, you walk for five minutes. Anything to get you up and moving is fabulous, and it can benefit in all these ways. So the piece of the minimizing our risk is on education. And so what we want to look at now is there are a number of lymphedema precautions that minimize our, our risk. And these are definitely not all of them, but these are the majority. We want to make sure that we pay attention to any changes that are occurring in your body, whether it's the chest or the underarm. We want to increase, uh, notice increased warmth or temperature difference. So you can feel one arm versus the other arm. Just feel all up and down your arm and then compare it to the other side. If you notice that there's a little bit more increased warmth in the side that looks, feels a little bit tighter, a little bit more pressure, heaviness, then that's something to monitor and then go get medical attention if, or speak to your physician, the nurse, the medical team, the lymph therapist, but generally it's to go to the medical team, because if it ends up being an infection, which we call cellulitis, that's something that the lymph therapist will not be able to assist you on. What they're going to do is refer you back to the physician, the medical team, to see if um, the diagnosis of cellulitis occurs and if there's antibiotics needed, or at least send you to the urgent care, emergent care um, center, local ER, to really have a, a physician or someone who can diagnose notice that. That is usually the first that you see if an infection is going to set on, this increased warmth and this temperature difference. You could also take your temperature to see if you have a low-grade fever. That's something, but it doesn't always happen. But definitely the warmth is something you can compare. The next thing that might occur is redness, streaking, splotchiness. And it can follow sometimes uh, the lymphatic uh, dermatome, the uh, lymphotome, and you can see where it's very specific, and it's like a, a streak that goes up your arm. It could be in a little area or a little a portion of your upper arm or forearm or the hand looks red. Um, so don't discount those and don't ignore those because uh, that's really uh, the next step that could be very important. When it becomes further along, you could also experience pain in which your arm is now inflamed, the chest is inflamed, something has an infection. That is a medical emergency that you definitely need to have a conversation with your physician. A person who has recurrent episodes of cellulitis, the infections, they, their physician might Um, what would you like us to do? And usually the physicians say, send them over or let them go to the local ER and they'll follow up. So it's very a team effort that we do this. Um, and again, I just want to remind us that the early symptoms of lymphedema generally are, have been noted in the research and literature to be the pressure, tightness, fullness, and heaviness um, that one experiences. Again, we have to differentiate whether you just had surgery or you just had radiation, like what the difference is. We want to make sure that you clean your cuts and scratches. We carefully wash and um, we make sure that we put a Band-Aid over and we look to see if there's redness developing and you want to monitor it. We want to test drive products. So all of a sudden you have, you go through cancer treatment and that favorite perfume, that favorite lotion that you love to use, that shower gel, all of a sudden you notice that your skin after chemotherapy and radiation is very sensitive. So what we try to say is we really try to not say no 
to unless we absolutely need to. But what you can do is to make sure that you're you're cleaning when you wash your fingers and your bathing that you definitely clean and and dry in between your fingers and your toes. We try using sensitive skin formulas, alcohol-free, fragrance-free products, and you want to spot test. So you want to take a little bit of that favorite lotion and just put it on your hand and see if you have any reaction. Is it itchy? Does it get red? That may be meaning like, okay, that's probably my body's a little bit sensitive to it, but use it on other parts of your body. Spot test and see if it's, you know, if you put it on your other arm or you put it on your, you know, behind your knee. I mean, you're still going to get some of that uh, aromatherapy um, and that's something to consider. So manicures and pedicures. I put pedicures on because even if, even though this is breast cancer related lymphedema, you know, if you get infection and it comes in through your toes or it comes in anywhere else, it could potentially exacerbate your, your arm lymphedema, right, or your hand lymphedema. So we want to make sure that manicures and pedicures are fine as long as you try to avoid cutting the cuticles because the cuticles are really your first and last line of defense between the nail and the nail bed. So bacteria can automatically enter the, the bloodstream through, uh, by, by going through any cuts in the cuticles. So I, I, I recommend, uh, we re generally recommend that you push the cuticles. So I usually say push, please, no cutting, thanks. Um, and I, when I go for manicures in those instances, I do also, I don't cut. And they will turn around and just want to get that little piece of skin. And I have to be firm with them. Now, you know, I've not gone through cancer treatment, but I have been firm and said, no, you know, I please do not use scissors or I'll pull my hand away. Um, so that's important to feel empowered to be able to do. You can bring your own equipment. And the bonus tip is actually if you push your cuticles after a couple cycles with the manicurist and what you push, your actual cuticles look better because when they cut it, it comes in raggedy. And so that's even better to try to push your cuticles. We want to wear loose, comfortable clothing. We don't want anything that's too tight. Um, when you take off your clothes, if you notice indentations, you know maybe that that piece of clothing, that bra, is a little bit too too tight um, around the bra wings, which are the sides of the bras, and maybe we need to go up a size. Um, so it's really important to take a look and look in the mirror to see where where we're getting those indentations. Is it along the broad strap over your shoulder? You know there are pads that you can do to disperse that pressure. Is it under the bra, the underwire? We generally say try not to use an underwire bra. Sometimes the support for the other side, if you're still, you know, the other side's still intact. It's it's something to work out with the prosthetist um, if you do need that prosthesis. Uh, or just to really find that comfortable bra with a wide bra um, band. We want to make sure that we notice any changes, swelling or puffiness. And then we have the body temperature. We want to make sure that we're protecting our body from the sun by wearing sunblock and then there's new clothing out that actually resists. You know, we monitor our body temperature, avoid extremes, the heat, the cold. The, for some reason, New York City individuals really have this uh, this uh, interest in jacuzzi and sauna, I've been asked so constantly, what can I do? And what I say is, listen, you can try anything. Just try it for a few minutes and see how it goes. Then you monitor it. Use the arm as the barometer. If your arm starts swelling up, okay, come out, do your drainage or do your breathing, do your, you know, relax, cool down, and then let the body calm down. Maybe that is not exactly the time. Or maybe if you did it for 10 minutes, you want to back it down to five minutes and go for a trial and see if that changes. So with the exercise, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, you know, like I do yoga, I'm going to try all these, and then it becomes overwhelming. I've never done yoga before. But, you know, exercise can be so enjoyable. We just have to find the right fit, right? And then meditation because we want to calm our mind, right? But then, you know, this happens to me too. Like things just go through our mind, and part that is part of meditation, to let it go through your mind, and then you bring it back to your breath or whatever, um, whatever meditation style that you're using. So what are the first steps? Consider your prior level of fitness, your current physical conditioning. So if you haven't exercised in 10 years, you're probably not advised to go and run on a treadmill. You want to make sure that you consult with your physician. You want to understand that if you went through chemo radiation, you might not be where you were before you started, and you have to really ramp back up. up. So what type of exercise are we talking about? We're talking about flexibility. We're talking about strength training, and we're talking about cardio. So this is, this is a triad that I really look to incorporate into an individual's return to exercise. Um, and then we talk about, well, how much? You know, Now, this varies for everyone, and that's why it's important to go and talk to your physician or if you're you know, requesting therapy from a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, 
but physical therapists can tell you along the lines of what maybe that you could do and develop an individualized treatment program based on your goals and what what you were doing prior, right? So if you were doing yoga prior, we might be doing activities to get you back to that, but we might have to modify with blocks. Um, so flexibility, I generally recommend five to seven times a week. I mean, we just need to stretch. As we get older, everyone just needs to stretch because as we don't get we don't stretch, we start getting tighter and tighter. So we want to make sure that prior to exercise we're stretching. Then we incorporate strength training. We start with no weights, right? No weights. And if you do the exercise, even range of motion correctly, you will find that, wow, I don't need any weights and I already feel my muscles. Because you're in proper alignment and it really just takes that awareness to say, I don't need a five pound weight. Then we progress from a zero pound weight, like a no weights, right, to one pound, two pound, three pound. So if you're looking for this, you definitely should talk to um, for a physical therapy referral, occupational therapy referral, they can help you with this. Cardiovascular training. So the Surgeon General says you should try to get up to seven days a week, 60 minutes a day. Now what we're looking for is if you can do 10 minutes, that's great. That's what we're going to do. If you can do it five to seven times a day, uh, I'm sorry, five to seven times a week, that's something that we really focus on too. Um, so the key points, slow, progressive, consistent, minimal to no soreness. You really don't want to be sore. When you're sore, that means that there's a breakdown of tissue um, and that really that creates inflammation. And inflammation brings blood, brings fluid, and that might exacerbate lymphedema. So we want to really do slow, progressive, and consistent. With the home exercise program of like weights or anything, progress a minimum of one to two weeks, you know, go slow. If you feel nothing, that's really what you want to feel. It might seem counterintuitive that you're using weights but you feel nothing or you're using no weights to feel nothing. You just want to give the body a little TLC to say, listen, I'm doing this movement and then I'm going to progress it. If you progress it, your body will let you know if it's too much. You need to listen to your body and say, I was too sore, it was too much, I need to bring it back down, I need to continue with the lower weight or I need to use no weights. And then request an evaluation with a physical therapist. So for lymphedema, we generally suggest wearing compression garment or multi-layer bandages, but that is actually really individualized and that's a conversation you should have with your treating therapist. For no lymphedema, you really just want to be observant and notice and track body's reaction. Different, different people, different schools of thought will tell you whether or not you should or shouldn't use compression garments or bandaging or if you have no lymphedema, it's not bandaging, but compression garments, and that's a conversation to determine with your medical team. Carrying and lifting, we want to minimize heavy lifting and carrying. We want to alternate using, you know, one shoulder versus the other. You want to lift with your legs, so carry groceries or bags close to your chest. When you hold it away, it increases it by, you know, whatever it is, five, three, five, six fold of the weight. And we want to work up the strength and the endurance training. To wax or not to wax, generally when we, we, we do say to try to avoid waxing when you're tearing away the wax, it just rips the hair follicles out, um, the hair out of the hair follicles, so that's something we, and that creates inflammation. The alternative is a, a man's razor, electric razor, they get a very close shave, or a straight razor. You just want to really look in the mirror and make sure there's no cuts with the straight razor. And then we want to protect our, our, our hands, right? You know, someone once said that they went into the oven and they didn't use oven mitts. I, I don't know what they were using, I don't, I, but they, re, they were burned. So I think obviously this is common sense, but sometimes you're not thinking. So we want to make sure you're following all these um, to minimize any injuries. And then the blood pressure. Now the blood pressure, there's a, again, a school of thought where blood pressure might not create a problem, but um, I err on the side of conservativeness, and I try to say if you have an unaffected side, to use it on that, and it's okay to request it. And it's important that you indicate, oh, can you use my left arm versus my right arm? You know, and for an injection, you want to make sure that you can... Um,
that is relatively new. Um, results have been promising. Um, so that is something to look into and discuss if that's, that's an interest for someone who has chronic lymphedema. Um, for those, for acupuncture also, there has been promising results um, of using it to definitely um, minimize side effects of chemotherapy, radiation therapy experience. But now there's promising studies in which could it be used for lymphedema treatment. Again, it's a little bit too soon, but I know um, there are different areas doing different schools and different institutions doing uh, research on, on acupuncture as well. So I wanted to just point those out. Those, yeah. These are the latest upcoming. upcoming. OK, so okay. now we have now questions we have and time for questions, hopefully. Great. Thank you, Ting Ting. That was really a comprehensive presentation. So much information. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. a few questions came in. So yeah. someone is saying that they have an area of continued swelling in their left elbow. Mm -hmm. She's had a partial mastectomy on the right side with chemo and radiation and reduction surgery on the left. Is this cause, is this lymphedema, first of all? Can it, was it caused by the, the left side reconstruction or something else, or what do you think? Okay, so just tell me again, the, the swelling is on which side? It's swelling in the left elbow. Mastectomy was on the right side. Oh. Um, well, that's hard. Number one, I'm just going to just clarify again that I, I cannot uh, diagnose, so I don't know, and I, I haven't seen the individual, so I'm sorry, I won't be able to tell you whether you have lymphedema or not. But, you know, generally it doesn't, it doesn't uh, translate to the other side if the left side didn't have any injuries or sur I mean, surgeries. Um, so if you have lymphedema on one side, or if you don't even have it on one side, it generally does not translate to the other side. Um, as it's considered unaffected. Mm -hmm. Is it common to just to have swelling just in one area, just like the elbow area? So if we're talking about a side that has had central lymph node or axillary dissection or radiation, it could. Some people have swelling just in the fingers. Some people have it just in the upper arm. Some people have it just in the forearm. And we don't know why one person has it in one area, why one person has an entire arm or they have it in a very specific, distinct, and stubborn area. But yes, it could happen. Right. OK, we have a question from Anne. I have stage 1 breast cancer in my right breast. I'm right-handed. I have not had surgery yet, so I don't know how many lymph nodes will be removed. I heard on Dr. Oz that using a rebounder daily helps is the movement of up and down, helps with the circulation of moving the fluid. Is this something you recommend? Um, a rebounder is jumping on a trampoline and it's going up and down, and, and, and it's essentially you know using gravity to, to kind of move the fluid um, into your central system. So has it been discussed about use in lymphedema um, or just in general? Yes. Uh, anything, I think exercise will promote uh, circulation and fluid um, movement. Another great thing is just deep breathing. When you have everyone, everyone should be breathing deeply um, and moving the belly, not just being upper breathers like a lot of women are. We tend to want to suck in our uh, stomachs and, and have that flat belly. But what we really want to do is kind of mimic our fellow counterparts, males, and let, kind of let it all hang out. We want to really, like if you'd right now just try to take a nice deep breath into your stomach and you feel it's very uncomfortable, it's because we're not used to breathing into our stomach. But what's really key is that when we do deep breathing, not to the point of hyperventilation, but deep breathing, the lymphatic system really kicks in and the fluid starts um, moving quite a bit. So deep breathing is also highly encouraged. Great, thank you. So someone is asking, someone is saying, I'm having a lot of pain off and on with my right wrist, which could, which could perhaps be fixed with surgery, but I'm concerned about getting lymphedema. I had 15 nodes removed with a right breast mastectomy in 2003. I've had metastatic disease to, since 2007 and have been taking only targeted drugs since then. Could PT help rather than surgery? I definitely, I definitely feel, feel that, I mean, well, I mean, you're asking a biased person because I am a physical therapist. <laughs> 
but being completely neutral as well, I definitely feel if it was my family or me, I would want to try, um, I want to gather all the information and then try conservative therapy. I think that that's important too because you really want to try to see if there's anything you can do non-invasively, which I think definitely surgeons agree and oftentimes they will send a person to um, PT or OT first to really have a trial and, and see if that helps. Now, if you're having pain and that doesn't work, then you have to consider and weigh the balance of your quality of life. Is this something that you can live with? Is there anything else that can be done during PT that says, oh, okay, you know what, the pain is not that bad, or it's only when I do this, because sometimes we're not even aware of what we're doing. We're sitting at a computer and our wrists are flexed and bent all the time, we're hunched over. If we just improve our posture, a lot of the discomfort could be potentially removed, and it might be coming from your neck. So I think a good thorough assessment, conversation with your physician, and then a comprehensive evaluation with the PTOT is definitely um, warranted and beneficial. Thank you. Can radiation alone cause lymphedema? So yes, so, yeah. radiation, radiation potentially can, can because what we're looking at is the strangulation of soft tissue around the lymphatic system and the vessels that are everywhere. I mean, if I peel off, I mean, it's kind of gross, but if I peel off the top layer of my skin, it's all lymphatics, and those are the superficial lymphatics. So when I move and gesticulate and I'm stretching my elbow, my arm, you know, all that opens, remember those one-way valves, and that so those valves then... Um, open and the fluid, the suction pulls in the protein of the lymphatic system. And so um, in terms of radiation, the lymphatic system has to have a natural, it has a natural propulsion and contractility. And when radiation occurs, it's very nonspecific. It will, it will try to attack the healthy as well as the non-healthy tissue that is trying and geared towards localized. And so when that happens, the tissues might strangulate around the, all the vessels, arteri arteries, um, veins, lymphatic system, and create um, less propulsion. And then, unfortunately, your lymphatic system is, you know, uh, in a dysfunctional mode at that point. Okay, another question. How many years after having one's lymph nodes removed does someone need to be worried about the occurrence of lymphedema? Is the time frame different for someone who had lymphedema post-surgery and someone who ever never had lymphedema? Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a great question, and that's a complicated question. You know, generally they say that within two years after surgery or you know radiation, that's that's the the time period where most commonly, if it occurs, lymphedema will develop. That's when it develops. So that's what the research and literature still says. It. Uh, generally, two generally up to two years. Two years. Um, um, there are individuals that develop it right away. Um, and we're not quite sure why that occurs. We're not quite sure. You know, it could be someone with one lymph node removed, and someone with 30 lymph nodes removed. They didn't develop lymphedema. It could be five years out. You all of a sudden had an injury, and that could develop lymphedema as well. And sometimes they say, "Oh, the longer you don't have it." then you have less risk. That could be an absolute possibility because the body has already rerouted and they figured out where it needs to go because it's kind of going around the roadblock. But what we want to remember is that as we get older, we also get tighter. We don't stretch out, you know, get up in the morning, you're a little bit more creakety and you need to like, you, you know, you feel some of those aches and pains. So... Flex, you know, flexing, uh, sorry, stretching is very important to go ahead and make sure that you're still continuing to do it as you go along, but that's why it's a little bit of a, a challenging question to answer. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to squeeze in a couple more questions before we end the webinar. Can carpal tunnel, tunnel syndrome trigger lymphedema? So I'm not sure if specifically, you know, carpal tunnel will trigger, but I will say that any injury could potentially trigger, a cut could trigger potentially, a mosquito bite. And that's because there's inflammation that occurs. So if carpal tunnel, that is basically overuse and that's um, an inflammation of the wrist, right? So with inflammation comes fluid. Uh, the body is trying to relax and trying to you know, decrease the inflammation. So it'll bring all the aspects um, that's needed to kind of clear out the inflammation. 
out of the system. Unfortunately, Unfortunately at the same, at same time, time, because it brings because fluid, fluid um, that's, also that's also where we have to be careful because that could that overload the lymphatic system, system, which was functioning fine, fine. But with this increase in fluid, fluid, then it kind of pushes it over the edge. And just one, one final question. If someone is having some of the symptoms that you mentioned in the slide, pressure, mm -hmm. um, fullness, redness, maybe some numbness, um, mm -hmm. but the arm does not appear to be swollen, is that an early sign of lymphedema? Mm -hmm. So it could be like the numbness is different, right? The numbness, the numbness could be from the surgical um, procedure where they needed to cut through the nerve, um, so you might have some numbness in the underarm area. Um, so that, that can be a common occurrence. The pressure tightness heaviness, again, it could be where, it depends on how far out you're after um, the, the surgical procedure, uh, if that is the case. And so that would then be something for you to go back to the medical team. Um, so what I do is I, I really encourage people to, to empower themselves and to know, like, it's important. This is our bodies, this is your bodies. If you have any questions or concerns, in a nice way, go back to the medical team and say, here's the thing, this is what I'm looking at, this is what I'm feeling. And if your gut, go with your gut. If your gut tells you, your instincts tell you, you know, I think I would benefit from a consultation with a lymphedema therapist or actually have some of my questions answered or set up a home exercise program, please go back and talk to the medical team um, and I know that they will come and, and assist you in this, um, you know, empowerment path, uh, process. Great. Thank you. Good advice. So thank you so much, Ting Ting, for this presentation. Um, thank you. Hoping that everyone got a lot out of it. If uh, you wouldn't mind just filling out the survey at the end of the webinar, it'll pop up. That helps to let us know how we're doing and uh, continue to offer programs. So thank you so much. Ting Ting and um, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.